Oh, yes, sir. Started. OK. Yeah, so I think we have 20 minutes or so. Uh, we'll just uh, get into a different topic altogether. It will be on uh, energy and power and not uh, in terms of performance or security. So uh, I, I think the WE folks are uh, more conversant with this, you know, power, energy, voltage, frequency term, but at a high level, uh, I think everyone can correlate uh, the notion of power because, you know, we, we are using our uh, uh, very various uh, electronics and electrical devices every day, and then they, they consume power, right? So similarly, uh, our microarchitecture structures, they also consume power, and uh, the power is actually uh, can be subdivided into two different components. So one is the dynamic power when you actually perform uh, some operations on a circuit or a microarchitecture unit, you, you consume power, so that's the dynamic power. And that is dependent on uh, the voltage and frequency that is driving those circuits. OK, uh, they, they are kind of dependent. The voltage and frequency, if you want to you know, uh, design a processor with high frequency, so that will also demand high voltage. So if you look at in terms of equation, uh, there is a cubic effect uh, in terms of the voltage frequency into the dynamic power. The other extreme is the static power. Even if you don't do anything and your uh, computer or the processor is on, it is still leaking current, right? So uh, basically you are still consuming power. Obviously it won't be that high uh, compared to when you are performing, let's say billions of operations, but still you are consuming power, okay? So th these are the two uh, broad categories of power that you will find in uh, micro architectural units. So uh, if you look at the trend, I don't have a recent trend. This is still you know, 12, 13 years old. The voltage that has been used in, in uh, commercial processor, it's actually going down, right? Uh, the main reason is to reduce power, but you can't actually you know, keep on decreasing. You can't make it 0, 0.0 something. Okay, so there are other uh, constraints that, that are not directly related to the architecture, but at the device level, there is there has to be a minimum voltage level that you have to uh, operate on uh, to to you know make sure that your processor or micro architecture units uh, operate properly but nevertheless the, the takeaway here is initially the community was trying to reduce the voltage so that the dynamic power will you know go down uh, directly right uh, but then uh, as, as we have already discussed that the dynamic power is also dependent on the frequency right it's a uh, uh, voltage as well as frequency and if you can correlate the role of frequency uh, in terms of power the simple example will be think about a memory instruction a load instruction right and if your processor is running at a higher frequency let's say 5 gigahertz right so that means one cycle is 0.2 nanoseconds and let's say your dram is running in 1 gigahertz right so the frequency gap is five times straight away so what will happen now your memory latency will be higher and higher the moment you increase the frequency. That is the first case, the uh, point number A, where actually uh, you know the processor is running at a very high frequency. But if you run a processor with a low frequency, let's say one gigahertz, right? That, that's the point number D, where eventually it turns out that you know the memory latency is shorter. So you, you can uh, simply uh, multiply the difference in frequency, right? Five times straight away uh, comes up if you increase the frequency. But all this latency that don't directly correlate with the power, right? So when you perform a memory operation, you actually wait for a particular uh, memory operation to uh, be completed. Let's say a load and the load enters at some point of time. It stays there in the ROB and then finally, let's say the ROB is stalled. You remember the ROB, the structure that is uh, used in the processor for out of order. And at this point, you know, the processor is actually doing nothing. It is completely choked, right? Uh, but but this portion is actually uh, not affecting your uh, latency anyway because of the out of order processor, right? So even if you change your frequency uh, from here to here, the latency is unaffected. So that, that's what I will show you next in a zoomed way. So if I have to magnify the notion of memory latency uh, for a given, uh, um, uh, you know, um, load operations or a, uh, a sequence of memory operations. So let's say you got a miss at the last level CAS and 
after that you go to DRAM. But even if you get a miss at the LLC, let's say at cycle T, uh, let's say there is a cycle T plus delta. Till that time, the processor was still filling instructions and the you know it was executing, the ROB was uh, not choked. So that means the latency is unaffected. It's getting amortized. The moment ROV is kind of becoming full and it's choked, then the latency will come into picture. And then the notion of frequency will come up uh, in terms of your you know, performance or power or whatever, right? Till that point, it's kind of unaffected. So that's why it's called inelastic area. This is the elastic area where you know your, your stall cycles actually affect your performance, energy, and other stuff, right? So ideally, what you want to do to minimize the dynamic power is the moment you know that you know the processor is actually waiting for a long latency load, you should actually decrease your frequency because they, the moment you uh, see that ROB is stalled, uh, that means you are entering into the elastic area, right? That will affect uh, both performance and energy, so you can reduce your frequency, right? D does that make sense? So this is the reason where you can actually play with the frequency to reduce power because uh, you know, uh, frequency is uh, one of the knobs through which you can actually drive uh, or, you know, minimize the dynamic power. So uh, to, to make sure that modern processors, they operate or they can operate at different voltage or uh, frequency level, they have something called uh, voltage regulators uh, or voltage and frequency regulators. So on the left hand side, you will see there is an OPCHIP regulator that drives the voltage for all the cores. So imagine a multi-core system where you have four cores and there's only one source that is driving all the cores, right? A modern avatar will have an on-chip regulator, uh, you know, and then that on-chip regulator will drive all the cores, but you can see the difference here. There's a voltage drop, you know, the power supply starts from 3.7, but there is some, you know, voltage drop because you're going through another circuit, then another circuit like that. Uh, the other extreme is wh why not have per core voltage regulator, right? You have on chip regulator, but they are kind of localized. It's not global, right? So in most of the mm, recent machines, you will find that you have uh, per core uh, DBFS regulators where you can actually control the voltage and frequency of each and every core. Okay. So uh, how to do it, how to control it? So uh, Linux kernel has, uh, you know, uh, facilities. It provides various modes. You know, if you want performance, high performance, then it knows what should be the voltage and frequency. If you need to have power saving mode, then it will actually, you know, reduce the, the voltage and the frequency level. So basically all these states are known as the P states, you know, different performance states. Depending on what you want, you can actually set it up. OK, th th this is uh, available at this path and go and set it up. Right. So basically you are dealing with both performance and power by changing or by playing with uh, frequency and voltage. And the way you are doing it is uh, with the notion of a P state that uh, defines whether you are demanding more performance, more power, or you, you are kind of in between, you know, on demand, right? So these are the various knobs that uh, can be, uh, you know, played with uh, depending on the requirement. Now, now if we come back to the static power, uh, I mentioned that, you know, even if you don't do anything, that there will be uh, uh, power consumption, and uh, there are two uh, broad proposals which are actually used to minimize uh, the static power. I'll take an example from the CASES because that's easy to follow. So what happens, uh, this is something from Intel IV Bridge. If uh, the CAS controller sees that, you know, there is no memory activity coming in, you know, the loads are not coming in frequently, it actually goes into a state called uh, power getting state where it destroys the state, meaning even the data is destroyed, right? You are actually going to a sleep mode where the data is completely destroyed. So this is the example of a 8 MB 16 way last level CAS. So if the CAS controller sees that, okay, there's hardly any request coming in, the MPK is almost zero point something, it converts that 8 MB CAS into a 512 KB CAS with two ways instead of 16 ways, okay? The downside of this particular approach is uh, if you want to get a, if, if there is a future request to one of these uh, 
CAS lines, which are already in the power getting mode, you have to go to DRAM now because the state is destroyed. The data is no longer there, right? So a better approach is uh, what is called the state preserving mode, where you know you you retain the data, right? Uh, but in a low power mode, but you can't access it. So if you understand the notion of uh, you know the bit line and word line uh, for, from your uh, organization or digital logic course, what it does is uh, it actually makes sure that the word line is actually running at a pretty low uh, power. So even if the data is there, you won't be able to uh, get the data. So you have to you know uh, improve your state uh, to the high power state, then only you'll be able to uh, get the data, right? So that that's what it is. So there will be a latency or a penalty from moving from this, uh, you know, low power mode or drowsy mode into the normal mode, right? Uh, so these are all implemented in a modern processor. You can actually go and check it, uh, wh whatever machine you are using, irrespective of uh, AMD, Intel, or whatever. Right? These are pretty famous ideas that have come from the microarchitecture community. Okay, so uh, any questions on uh, this uh, static dynamic power or the ideas at a high level? Sir, can you go back to the slide with uh, like the deeper uh, detailed picture of elastic time? Elastic, okay, yeah, go on. Yeah, so uh, in in this case, the uh, frequency is scaled down, right? Yeah, so my point is if you scale down your frequency here in the inelastic area, yes. right, uh, it will have absolutely no effect. See, basically, if you increase frequency, that means you are telling your processor to do more work in less time. Yes, right. Sir. But in inelastic area, it has no effect because you know the ROV is doing the job for you by uh, providing uh, out of order execution with you know higher level of instruction level parallelism. Right. Okay. The moment you are stalled here, then the effect of frequency will show up because now you are actually going to memory and memory choking your ROV. So kind of in the elastic area, uh, this uh, like the CPU is kind of uh, stalled completely. Uh -huh. So this is basically just to reduce power, right? No, this is a way in which you can decide when to reduce the frequency because you know that my processor is waiting for the DRAM to respond, right? You yeah. can actually reduce the frequency now. Yes, yes, uh, but the implication is to power reduce power I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Because even if you are running five gigahertz at this point of time, there is nothing to be done, right? <laughs> you you can't yes. do anything. Uh, the ROB is full. Even if there is a simple add instruction, you can't do that. Yeah, my question was like, uh, what is the end result? Just to reduce the power. Yeah, yeah just to reduce the dynamic power. Okay, okay. But yeah. to decide when exactly to, you know, yeah, yeah, that, that, that part, part, yes, yes. So okay. usually you will find uh, text or maybe some material where they say that okay, the moment you get LLC miss, you know, reduce your frequency. That's not correct. Okay. And then with uh, larger ROB size, you know, deeper ROB with with the modern processor, you will find you know 500, 700 entries ROB. It may happen that you know LLC miss may not be a bottleneck. Okay, so. Yeah, so that that's the key uh, takeaway from this uh, particular plot. Okay, so let me get into uh, the security side. So in, instead of you know uh, teaching you some of the papers that are exploiting DBFS uh, for for information leakage, I will float papers. Uh, but but one paper that I would uh, kind of recommend because this is from my group. So this is on CAS attack, flush based CAS attacks, and uh, this paper actually talks about the effect of DBFS on, uh, uh, you know, all the flush based attacks, flush and reload and flush and flush. This recently appeared, or it will appear in Woot, which is a forum for offensive technology. This is a unique uh, symposium where they only accept offensive papers. Okay, so but typical academic papers are usually not accepted. Uh, so it's a pretty unique forum, at least in the security community. So that's where it got through finally. So you can you can look at it and see how you know DBFS can affect the effectiveness of less attacks. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, digress a bit from security and uh, come back to uh, the performance side. So we talked about the notion of power. 
but finally we need a metric which can you know balance both performance and power at the end of the day if i want to quantify my processor or cas or you know any microarchitecture unit i should have a metric which can say that okay this this is the power efficient uh, along with you know high performance uh, microarchitecture unit right so basically these are the metrics that are used so we are always like we always use the execution time as a metric which is ipc indirectly and uh, energy is power into time right uh, so what uh, the community or most of the folks use is something called energy delay product so energy is nothing but power into time and now if you want to you know emphasize both performance as well as uh, energy then uh, what you can do is you can multiply runtime again right so this is uh, the power into runtime is actually your energy and this is actually your delay which is nothing but the runtime again right if you want to uh, you know emphasize performance further if you say that no i want to design a processor where performance is two times more critical than uh, power then you should go for let's say ed square p or ed qp where you are actually uh, emphasizing the latency part more compared to the power okay so but the, these are the commonly used uh, metrics that uh, you will find in uh, you know any uh, academic literature or even in uh, you know uh, commercial uh, companies white papers okay so we, that let me jump into a trend that that came up sometime in 2009 which is called dark silicon uh, it, it was a uh, pretty uh, i would say breathtaking paper uh, to the entire uh, community so if you look at uh, the the notion of multi cores multi cores came sometime around 2004 5 6 kind of they started becoming two core four core and suddenly this this paper uh, came from wisconsin in 2009 and it says that uh, you know even if you increase the number of cores let's say tomorrow i go for uh, you know 16 cores 32 cores 64 cores 100 cores why because thanks to moore's law more number of transistors on chip uh, so i can actually put more and more uh, i can cram more transistors inside a chip right but uh, if you remember i mentioned about uh, the denner scaling which was the power density right uh, power consumption per area that used to be a constant uh, let's say till 2009 that that's not the case now even now it's not the case right so what happens because of uh, the end of denner scaling and uh, because of moore's law is you are putting more and more transistors inside chip but finally at the end of the day if you are going for smaller transistor size and you are trying to improve frequency increase frequency it may happen that the power budget that a particular chip has can sustain only few cores so for example if you have a 16 core system and if you want to run those 16 core system let's say with 4 gigahertz the power budget of the entire chip will say that boss i can't do that i can you know maximum i can allow only four cores so that means rest of the eight cores are actually sitting in a dark island which is actually the dark silicon problem okay uh, i'll i'll uh, share the paper if you are interested go and read this paper pretty uh, you know uh, revolutionary in terms of insights so th this is the example uh, if if you move from let's say 2008 to 2020 the transistor size is uh, you know going down it's shrinking uh, and uh, what it is showing is you know the usual trend was okay i will increase frequency because that will give me more power and but what happens with with uh, dark silicon is if you are going down from let's say 45 nanometer to 22 nanometer and your frequency is going up let's say from 1 to 1.6 it turns out you can only power up 25% of the entire chip right and it becomes worse if you go to let's say 11 nanometer it becomes even worse if you go for let's say 7 5, 7 or 5 or whatever right so here you can see only 10 percent of the entire chip you can actually power on the rest of them are actually dark they can't do anything right so now all the you know the free lunch that the micro architecture community used to have that okay just just increase the number of cores moore's law is there so we'll just you know go for thousand core system it's not going to work just to build up some curiosity you should actually you know think about why why exactly it happened why did uh, the denner scaling uh, or, or the the denner's law was actually um, it failed right what exactly is the reason so try to find it out and then put it on piaja i will give you bonus uh, plus one point right 
So you must have heard about the various walls, right? The memory wall where the instructions are waiting for uh, the data from memory, the ILP wall, you can't push the instruction level parallelism boundary. So now it creates another wall called the utilization wall where because of the power budget, you are unable to utilize the entire chip. Even if there are, uh, you know, micro architecture units, processor uh, and other things, you can't use it, right? So because of this particular problem, uh, the community jumped into a new way of uh, designing processor, which is single ISA heterogeneous processor. OK, and the idea was, can we have uh, a single ISA, uh, let's say ARM or x86, which will be used by heterogeneous processor? Some are, you know, let's say power efficient, some are performance efficient. So this is one example from ARM. Uh, the left side is uh, ARM big processor and the right side is the little processor. The difference between ARM big and little is in terms of ISA, both are the same. But in terms of micro architecture, they are completely different. So this is a deeper pipeline, more micro architecture optimizations here. There are hardly anything, right? So now uh, to you know tackle the dark silicon problem, what you can do is if you are concerned about power, you can schedule your code in this particular little core. And if you are concerned about performance, you should schedule your uh, you know code or application in this big core, right? So that, that's how the OS scheduler will come into picture. So depending on uh, you know the load, the, the CPU load, the, the entire system load, and uh, the power budget that, that you have set in for your processor, it will decide whether to put it here or here, right? So it, it's kind of a sweet spot in terms of your uh, performance and power. So these are actually uh, micro architectures or uh, the, the processor that have come from ARM, you can see the power and performance sweet spot. And uh, the A15s are actually high performing uh, processors. That's why they take more power. And A7 are actually uh, low power processors, the little ones. OK, and then the ARM came up with this uh, big little architecture where it kind of it's a fusion of both, right? You can have a multi-core, so that's what uh, it has in uh, modern, uh, you know, ARM multi-core processor. Some of the mobiles have this kind of architecture, where you know you have uh, multiple uh, cores, where uh, some cores will be A15, highly, uh, you know, uh, super scalar, out of order, all the fancy techniques, and the A7 ones, you know, pretty simple, hardly anything, but energy efficient, right? And uh, they can interconnect. Actually, they, they are interconnected through the basic CAS coherence, uh, you know, ring or bus or whatever. And uh, depending on the requirement, you know, you can actually switch. So the OS scheduler can actually migrate the data, which is or the, the code that is running in A15 to A7 or A7 to A15. Okay, that that's all possible. Okay, so uh, that's all. Uh, actually, I have. Uh, you can actually try to think about the connections from energy power into thermal issues and uh, maybe the CO2 emission, right? Most of the companies, if you look at Microsoft, Facebook and all, they want to go green by 2030 or 2050. And uh, power and energy is actually the first step. There are other steps which actually correlate with the final CO2 emission. OK, so with that I will stop. Uh, Birendra, you can stop the recording. OK. Any questions, anyone? Um, I, I have a 